This segment of the Chapter 10 Lecture is titled The Age of Jackson, and the focus question is, in what ways did Andrew Jackson embody the contradictions of democratic nationalism? Andrew Jackson was a man of contradictions. He was not well-educated, but he was eloquent. He championed the common man, but excluded Indians and African Americans from democracy. He rose from modest origins to become a rich man and slave owner in Tennessee. He disliked banks, paper money, and some of the results of the market revolution. He was a strong nationalist who believed that states, not the federal government, should govern. And he opposed federal intervention in the economy or interference in private life. By Jackson's presidency, politics was a mass activity, constantly engaging millions of Americans and penetrating all spheres of life. It was a mass spectacle with enormous meetings, party newspapers, parades, and celebrated political orators. Large national conventions replaced congressional caucuses in nominating candidates. Political parties and urban political machines dispensed patronage in the form of jobs, assistance, and other benefits. Jackson himself introduced the spoils system, in which a new administration replaced previously appointed officials with its own party's appointees. Furthermore, newspaper publications dedicated to communicating party platforms and stances played an increasingly prominent role in shaping public opinion. Newspaper editors helped to write Jackson's speeches and communicate between the White House and local officials. Politics in the age of Jackson concerned issues associated with the market revolution and tensions between national and sectional loyalties. Political debate centered on banks, tariffs, currency, internal improvements, and the balance of power between national and local authority. The market revolution shaped many party positions. Democrats tended to be alarmed by the growing gap between social classes and warned that non-producers, such as bankers, merchants, and speculators, were using connections with government to enhance their wealth to the disadvantage of producers, such as farmers, artisans, and laborers. They wanted government to avoid interfering with the economy and giving special favors to economic interests. Without government interference in the market, ordinary Americans would compete fairly in a self-regulating market, and the most meritorious would succeed. Democrats tended to be upcoming businessmen, farmers, and urban workers. Whigs supported the American system, believing that the protective tariff, internal improvements, and a national bank could develop the economy and spread prosperity for all classes. They were strongest in the Northeast, the most modernized region. Many bankers and businessmen supported their program, as did farmers near rivers, canals, and other waterways. While many slaveholders supported the Democrats, who believed states' rights protected slavery, the largest Southern planters voted Whig. Party battles of the Jacksonian era reflected conflict between public and private definitions of American freedom and their relationship to government power. To Democrats, liberty was a private entitlement best protected by local governments and threatened by a powerful national state. With Jackson, the national government's power decreased. Weak federal power ensured private freedom and states' rights, so Democrats under Jackson reduced spending, lowered the tariff, killed the national bank, and refused federal aid for internal improvements. States thus replaced the federal government as the main economic actors, planning road and canal systems and chartering banks and other corporations. Democrats also thought individual morality was a private concern, and they opposed attempts to impose a uniform moral vision on society, such as temperance laws restricting or banning the production and sale of liquor, or Sabbath laws banning business on Sundays. This was one reason that Irish and German immigrants tended to vote Democratic. Democrats supported policies that enhanced the free agency of individuals, leaving them free to make their own decisions and pursue their own interests. Whigs believed that liberty and power reinforced each other. They thought an energetic federal government enhanced freedom, and liberty required a prosperous and moral America. Government would create the conditions for economic development, producing prosperity for all classes and regions. Like the Federalists, wealthy Whigs saw society as a hierarchy of social classes. But unlike the Federalists, they believed class status was not fixed. Individuals could rise in society through hard work. Whigs also believed the government should intervene in individuals' lives to ensure that they acted as free moral agents and thus supported schools, 
temperance laws, and Sabbath laws. Dedicated to states' rights, Jackson's first term saw his efforts to uphold federal supremacy over states. The 1828 tariff, which raised taxes on imported goods, aroused opposition in the South, particularly in South Carolina, where it was called the Tariff of Abominations. Believing that the tariff punished Southern consumers in order to benefit Northern industry, South Carolina's legislature threatened to nullify it, that is, to declare it null and void in South Carolina. South Carolina had a higher percentage of slaves than any other state and was ruled by an oligarchic elite of large plantation owners alarmed by the Missouri controversy and by growing federal power. Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, developed a theory of nullification. In it, he argued that states had created the national government and each state retained the right to prevent the enforcement of Congress's laws within its border that seemed to exceed powers written in the Constitution. Opponents, such as Daniel Webster, argued that the people, not the states, had created the Constitution and the federal government, and that nullification was illegal, unconstitutional, and treasonous. While no other southern state threatened nullification, Calhoun's theory offered the South a political philosophy to use when sectionalism intensified. Calhoun argued that the theory did not threaten disunion, but preserved it, allowing unique and diverse states to preserve their interests while remaining part of the federal union. To President Jackson, however, nullification was disunion. In 1832, when a new tariff was enacted, South Carolina declared it would be null and void the next year. In response, Jackson persuaded Congress to pass the Force Act, authorizing them to use the military to collect the tariff in South Carolina. To avoid war, Henry Clay, along with Calhoun, created a compromise tariff in 1833 that reduced duties. South Carolina rescinded the nullification law, and Calhoun abandoned his Democratic Party in Jackson for Clay and Webster and the Whigs, where they were united only by their hatred for Jackson. Jackson's nationalism and commitment to national sovereignty also showed in his Indian policy. The last Indian resistance in the Old Northwest ended in American victory in the Black Hawk War in 1832. In the South, cotton spread introduced land-hungry white settlers into areas where civilized tribes, such as the Cherokee, Choctaw, and Creek, had long practiced white ways, including slavery. But in 1830, Jackson secured passage of the Indian Removal Act, which allowed for the removal of tens of thousands of Indians from the Southwest. The law repudiated Jeffersonian notions that Indians could be assimilated and eventually incorporated into white America. The Cherokee in Georgia, threatened with expulsion by that state's government, had their own constitution, schools, and English newspaper. They appealed to the Supreme Court to protect their land rights, which had been guaranteed in treaties with the federal government. In 1832, the court decided that Indians did not in fact own their land, but were rather nomads who only had a right of occupancy. Another Supreme Court decision defined Indians as wards of the federal government who did not have full rights as citizens and were not independent nations sovereign from state governments. A subsequent decision seemed to reverse this judgment, giving Indian nations a separate political identity to be dealt with by the federal government, not the states. But Jackson refused to enforce this last decision, and he let Georgia expel the Cherokee with help from the federal government which sent troops to forcibly remove them and other tribes in the 1830s. The Indians were forced to move to territories in the West with inferior land. Thousands died on the way. In Florida, the Seminoles resisted removal for seven years by fighting a costly guerrilla war against American troops, but they too succumbed. By the 1840s, Indians had all but disappeared as a visible presence in the eastern states of America. <laughs>